Good morning. Good morning. This morning, we're going to celebrate two important events in the life of the church. Um, usually, we do these separate, but we're going to kind of bring them together today. If Epiphany is one, and the uh, baptism of, of our Lord is the other, and we're going to focus today on baptism, uh, have a time where we can remember our baptism and renew our baptismal covenants after the service, or at the end of the service. Epiphany is about seeing Christ. You know, we often talk about having epiphany moments, and it's a time of the manifestation where, where we can see Christ. The wise men saw the star, and they saw the birth of Jesus. Well, also, baptism is a manifestation where we see Christ. Christ saw the heavens opened, and that was a, an epiphany as well. So as we begin our day of celebration, uh, let us uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, wise men came to Jerusalem looking for Jesus, but some were afraid and some were confused. Let us come to you this morning with the same wonder that the wise men from the east had. Let us have our epiphany as we celebrate your coming to us, both in birth and in baptism. Amen. Amen. Morning. Good morning. Let's stand and sing number 245, all the verses of the first Noel.
Please remain standing as we repeat the Apostles' Creed, number 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Good morning. God is good. And all the time. And guess what? Nobody loves you like Jesus does. And let's remember that as we go through this week. Let's try a little kindness, share a little love, and be nice to all those around us. This week in our prayer request or our announcements, the, the flower list for 2021 is on the bulletin board. Please make note of anyone you wish to celebrate, whether it's in memory or in honor of someone's birthday. Uh, please note that on the list. We also have a music list for 2021. If there's a particular Sunday you want to sing, please let me know. And if you don't, you might get drafted. So, so that's how that might go. And if you sing and you never told anybody and you want to sing, let me know that too. Also, we have a note from Dr. Slusher this morning. Uh, she says, we're taking this time to again say thanks for all your love, prayers, support, hats, blankets, etc. Just sent a pack of them to Egypt, praying I can travel sometime in 2021. Blessings and love, Dr. Tina. Also, we want to announce, and most of you have probably seen it, that the hospital has a registry for those who are 70 years or older to be able to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And the hospital website is pmcvaccine.com. So if you'd like to get your COVID vaccine at the hospital, that's a way you can do it if you're over 70 years old. You need to register, although there is a drive through vaccine place tomorrow where Jerry's used to be. So uh, if you want to do that, but you have to register first. Also, we'll be taking down Christmas direct decorations directly after church. The more that helps, the quicker we get it done. Any other announcements? <coughs> this morning on our prayer list, we want to continue to remember Ann Sydney Parrish. Uh, she, her treatments are close to being at an end. Robert Staggs, Cooper Coleman, his grandmother, Diane Coleman, has a biopsy tomorrow. Please remember that family. Those battling COVID, Jean Morrison is still in ICU. Juanita Morrison got to come home and is recovering. And there's many, many others, so let's keep those in our prayers. Those suffering from addiction and are in treatment, Jack and Andrea Atkins' baby Aaron, who had surgery this week for a tumor, I think, on her kidneys, and pray that the biopsy is clear. Serena Spurlock is in the hospital. The family of Marcia Thacker, Laura Adams' mom. Carla Fields isn't feeling well this morning. Let's remember her. Ron Burchett isn't with us today because he best said he hurt his leg and he was gone to the hospital to get it checked. So let's remember Ron. Let's remember Jeff McKinney and Christine and all their family. Any other spoken requests? If nothing else, we ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. We are living in the day of social media, good or bad, and uh, that means that in our churches that we 
oftentimes we may fail to remember that uh, some people, not everyone wants uh, their prayer requests, especially things going on on social media. Uh, I, I want us to uh, just remember that. Uh, I do feel like that if they post it publicly, then it's okay for us to, to share that. And so most of these that, that we mention are, have already been posted in their public knowledge. Uh, but we want to be sensitive to people that may have not publicly posted or given permission for us to share. I just want us to be aware of that uh, with this day and age that we live in. We have to remember that our service also goes out uh, on social media. So any unspoken requests? God sees your hand and knows the needs that it represents. And uh, I, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. And as we think about everything going on today, uh, we are entering in a new year and we've all witnessed the, the riots and things. And, uh, you know, it's all it's concerning, should be concerning for all of us um, as we think about this. And and I want to say, you know, violence is I don't think violence is the answer on either side. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. advocated protests, nonviolent protests, and uh, winning others by love is is the way we do that. And sometimes, you know, we uh, it can be one-sided. You know, it seems like if one side does it, the other one uh, talks about it and the, and forgets the other side. You know, so it was wrong when uh, during the uh, Black Lives Matter riots. It was wrong then when people were looting and burning. It's wrong when we do it. Uh, if we do, if we go into, if we call ourselves Christian, and and we go uh, and we riot, all that, it's wrong. It doesn't matter if it, you're black or white, Democrat or Republican. It doesn't matter. Uh, we need to set an example for others. And so today, as we think about this in our world, I just want to say that that hate is wrong. And we need to guard against that. So let us pray with that in mind. Dear Lord, we are people who need you in your fullness. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our lives have complications and pain. Our world has war and despair. And we pray for those now whose lives have been affected by the pandemic. We pray for those whose hearts ache, hurt by the disturbing acts we've witnessed in our nation. We pray for our leaders in politics that they can put aside their pettiness and work together. We pray for those who are overwhelmed by loneliness and isolation. Even though, Lord, you're always with us, we want to pray for them. And we pray for these prayer requests that have been lifted today, both spoken and unspoken. We pray for our church, United Methodist and Church Universal, the Holy Catholic Church. And God, we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespassing as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. So at this time, we're going to uh, do our doxology uh, for our offering. And, and rem just remind you, the offering plate is in the, I don't know if we call that the front or the back. We come in that door, I'm, I'm assuming it's the front, in the foyer, uh, the offering plate. And uh, it's good to have Richie back with us. And as soon as we sing our doxology, I want to, if he would, stand and say the blessing over the offering.
That's true. <clears throat> here, here, Josh, we come to you again this morning. We do want to thank you for this day that you've given us. We want to thank you for looking down on us for a period of time which there is doubt in every heart and every soul in this world. And God, we know that you're still in control and you still have our power to cure all and to lead us into a better day that's ahead. God, as we come here this morning, we do want to thank you for giving us the opportunity and the desire to be back in your house and hope, dear God, that we can continue to worship together one with another. God, I would ask that you would bless the service that's about to come forth in the Word. And as that Word goes forth, dear God, I will pray that it can sink in the hearts of the people. Someone could hear something, whether it's in, in this building or in the community, that they can see here, Lord, that they need you in their lives and they fall out of sin before it be too late. I would ask now that you bless this offering and as we present it to you through this church, dear Lord, I pray that it can be used in your, in your name to bring glory to those in need and to bring hope, dear Lord, for someone that is looking for just a little bit of help. Again, dear God, bless us in this service. It's my prayer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As John's coming to uh, get ready to do a song, I want to mention we have a thank you card here from Pikeville Medical Center. Our church donated a couple infant seats to the uh, OB floor. And from time to time, we have families who, when they're discharged, they don't have a car seat for the infants. And so I've uh, asked whoever wants to donate toward that, and we've had some donations. And we want to be uh, just thank you for that.
you all for yes. such a blessing. That was extraordinary. Thank you. Our scripture text today is from the New Testament, the book of Mark, uh, chapter 4, verses 4 through 11. <clears throat> chapter 1, sorry. Chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Thank you. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful example um, that Jesus gave to us and that we will remember today. Please bless our pastor as he explains this to us and helps us understand the mysteries of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to reiterate the beauty of that, uh, the singing and the piano playing. Thank you. Usually you have to pay big money to hear that, but it's very good. You know, uh, when my wife Sandy sends a text or an email, I often accuse her of writing a book. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, she leaves very little unsaid. And, and on the other hand, my texts uh, are usually very short and choppy. And I have been accused of coming across a little rude because I just uh, put just the points and sometimes I don't put the niceties in there that is supposed to, I guess. And so I'm working on that. I'm working on that. Uh, I remember the old uh, dragnet shows where they would be interviewing someone and a neighbor or something and talking about something and he would say, just the facts, man. Just the facts. And so uh, a lot of times that's kind of what I like to do. And I just want to give the facts and not go around it. But as we come to the day, to the book of Mark, uh, and, and yes, this is the year of Mark, by the way. We're entering into year B. And just so you know, not that you want to know, but I'll tell you anyway, uh, the three years of the church cycle, A, B, and C, and A, uh, Matthew, B, Mark, and C, Luke. And you ask, what about John? Well, John is dispersed in all three years. So there's a little bit of John every, every year. But we're in year B, the year of Mark. And there's one thing about Mark. Mark is one of those would say just the facts. He, he gives you, a, it's, it's almost like a, a gallop. He's in and out. And, and he'll tell you the story and you're wondering what in the world's going on. In Mark, there are no magi in Mark's story. No star guiding the path along the way. There's no dancing angels proclaiming the birth of Jesus. The story begins with John by a river. And uh, he's there by the river, and then there's a tearing of heavens, and everything gets remade, and a dove descends from heaven. And there's nothing in his conversation between Jesus and John that appears in the gospel that, that appears in the gospel of John. Nothing about that conversation. Just in and out, get it done, just the facts. There's no description of the baptism at all. Did you notice that? He just came to be baptized. He was coming up out of the water and he saw what he saw. It's like he skipped over the event itself. And, you know, given how much we argue about baptism and about the methodology of baptism, you would think he would give us a little more information there. But no, it's almost like he is, uh, you know, uh, really concerned about not so much as the event as what happens afterwards. And maybe that is exactly his point. Maybe that is his point. On the walk to Emmaus, and it's a three-a-day event. And every day after that is known as the fourth day. The fourth day is everything that happens after your Emmaus experience. A lot of people get excited when they go on a retreat such as a walk to Emmaus and, uh, you know, promise to do all these changes and then nothing changes. Well, baptism is the beginning of the Christian life and it's the time we make a commitment and make promises. We're going to do a little bit of that today, just a, a recommitment, a renewing of our vows. Do you remember your baptism? You know, some do. Some remember it. It's fresh in our minds. It hasn't been that long ago. We were baptized when we were youth or uh, when we were, uh, as an adult, we were baptized. But then there are some of us in our church today who do not remember it because it happened before we understood a lot of things. We were maybe an infant and, and we were baptized. And so it happened before our rememberers kicked in. Yet even for those who remember or do not, uh, we, we do remember in a way because we're reminded at least every year of our baptism. And we're told to remember our baptism. The life as baptized believers, as baptism and as people who were baptized at a younger age, it's a life of our what matters after what happens afterwards that matters. You know, there's been some important events in, in, in Bruce's life and 
I think back, you know, we talk sometimes about, do you remember when you were a baby and this happened? And, and one time we were talking about a time he, he fell uh, on the stairs. <laughs> and I'm like, do you remember that? And he's like, I feel like I remember it. He said, I don't know if I remember it because I, I, I actually recall it or because I've been told the story so many times that it's in my brain. So I feel like I remember it. Well, baptism is sort of like that. And that's what it's all about. It's a remembrance even if you don't remember. How can you remember something you don't remember? Well, it's a reminder of the fact that we were baptized. And it's kind of like renewing our vows, wedding vows, all that. Uh, those same vows that were there then are there now. It's an important day in the life of a Christian, in the life of the church. I told you once about a teacher I had in seminary who uh, went to visit a patient that he knew was a member of his church with dementia. This patient could not remember his own children. But when they asked him, do you remember this man? The patient said, oh yes, I remember him. He baptized me. And because of that event was so important to them in their mind, they never forgot it. So when we think about baptism, uh, you know, there's a lot of different understandings and all that. First of all, where did it come from? Where did this concept come from? Uh, did it begin with John the Baptist and Jesus? Well, actually, it, it started long before that. You can find examples of it even in the Old Testament. There's a lot of different religions that do uh, baptisms and purifications. And the Jews were one of those that in the Old Testament, before the priests would do certain acts of sacrifices or whatever, they would go through a ritual. Sometimes it was a cleansing of hands. Sometimes it was almost like a, a, a full bath. They would pour water or whatever they had in those days in the temple. And so this wasn't so much to wash away dirt and to be clean as it was a purification. If someone had touched an unclean animal or person, they would be required to purify themselves before offering sacrifices. As we get over into closer to the New Testament, we find examples of people even in the desert, the Essenes, and people that John the Baptist may have come from this desert people that were doing a type of baptism for people who were Gentiles, not Jews, who wanted to identify with the Christ or believers or even before Christ who wanted to be identified with, as a Jew. They would do a type of baptism probably a lot of times in the river or wherever they could find. So that when John the Baptist was baptizing people and he was bapt baptized Jesus, people were not standing there thinking, what in the world is going on here? We've never seen anything like this. No, they understood this was something that was, was done. Jesus was baptized not because He had sin, but to fulfill all righteousness and to be an example for others. And so, we want to distinguish just a moment today when we talk about baptism, two different kinds, really. And I'm not talking about the mode, but I'm talking about there is the water baptism and then there's spirit baptism. And they run together a lot of times and we kind of lump them together when we talk about it, but there is a distinction. And that is that when we become believers in Christ, that we are baptized or placed into the body of Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. To, to be placed into something, and that is the church. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the true significance of baptism. And the water simply is a picture of what is going on inwardly of us. And so the water, really, uh, it all happens around the same time, because when we get saved, uh, hopefully we, we 
do the baptism around the same time. But the baptism is not the Spirit. The water, that is, is not actually the Spirit. But it's a picture of what the Spirit does when we're baptized and we come out of the water to the news of life. Same way is the, when we take communion. The bread and the wine are not actually the blood and the body of Jesus. We understand that, although some may uh, disagree with that. The bread and the wine are simply a picture of the sacraments of what Christ did for us. And it, I believe Christ is present in the communion just like He's present in the baptism, even the water baptism. But we need to understand that spirit baptism is essential in that we all uh, become children of God when we're spiritually baptized. And uh, there is a difference, but we kind of lump them together. And so we do that a little bit today probably. So what is the significance of baptism? What is the purpose in all that? Uh, I, I think there's some things, uh, of course, there's many. But as we look at uh, from our example in Scripture, at least today, I want to say just a few things. First of all, it changes our perspectives. Baptism changes the way we look at things, the way we see things. The Bible says here that just as he was coming out in verse 10 of the water, he saw. Let's stop right there. He saw. Jesus saw something. When we are baptized, when we are saved, when we come to know Christ, our perspective changes and we begin to see things differently than we have before. I once was blind, but now I see. Another song that's not in our churches, but one I can remember is, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Well, I think you could say that as you become a Christian, things that were unclear before become more clearer in the light of the Holy Spirit. And there were things that I saw, and I remember when I was saved and baptized, that the world just seemed to look different. The way I looked at people was different. And I could see clearly now that the rain was gone. And you know, I think that we all have to be careful today as we think about things that's going on in the world. There's such a thing as what I would call blind loyalty, where we can be loyal, so loyal to a party, to a person, that we are blind to everything else. I see that a lot today. Actually, our allegiance should be to Christ and Christ's work for the earth. But when we get to the point where we can only, where we're so blind to a particular group or a particular person, we are setting ourselves up in dangerous territory. That's how people uh, follow a person like Jim Jones, because they are blind to the truth. But what grace does and what the Scriptures do and what the Holy Spirit does is opens our eyes to be able to see different things. And we're not just looking at one angle, but we're able to see things from a different perspective. Therefore, when we see things that are contrary to the Scriptures, co contrary to uh, the Holy Spirit, contrary to love, we immediately know this isn't right. Not, and it, you know, even if someone that we follow says it's okay, we understand it's not. And I think that salvation changes our perspective. Number two, baptism empowers us for living. And I'm speaking primarily of spirit baptism, but again, they kind of run together. You know, when I do at the hospital, I do a lot of baptisms, and, and sometimes the patient, we do have a baptistry that we're able to take them down, and there's a lift that can pick them up if they're not able to walk, put them in the water. But sometimes they have machines or wounds that won't allow us to do that. And the only uh, alternative is to do a sprinkling or pouring in the room. And you would be surprised at the people, including Baptists and whoever, who've done that because they want a type of baptism done. But 
understand, and I, I, I perfectly explain that the water that we use in those, it's not any kind of holy water, it's just tap water usually. When we fill up the baptistry here, it's just regular water that we all take a bath in. There's nothing in that water that's magical, that's going to take away your sins. It's what it represents that really matters. But the Holy Spirit enables us to live a different kind of life. Verse 10 also says, As He come up out of the water, He saw the heavens torn apart, and the heavenly dove descend, ascending. So, He's coming up, and He's seeing things different, and it's a new life. It's a new ministry, even for Christ, to be able to, uh, to understand the things He understands. And the Scripture says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, that we, are buried, we were buried with Him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You get that? It's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of every person. Not just Christ, but resurrection. Death and resurrection is in all of creation. That when we are baptized, and I, I think immersion pictures this best, but when we're baptized and we're laid into that water, it's a picture of a burial, of a dying to the old person and the old self. And of course, when we come out of the water, a new resur a resurrection to something new. That walk in the newness of life. Colossians 2 verse 12, having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. That same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that <clears throat> who gives us power and will someday raise us from the dead. G John the Baptist said this in verse 8. He said, I baptize you with what? Water. But He will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit. Distinguishing those two. And understanding that the Spirit gives life. And it changes our life. So, baptism is a picture of dying to the old life. I remember when I was baptized, and it was in a pond in Flat Gap, Kentucky. And, uh, you know, that <clears throat> was a wonderful day. I would like to say I came out of that water and I walked a straight and narrow ever since, but that would be a lie. But I would tell you this, it did change my life. It changed my life. There was something about it. And even though the water in that pond was probably nasty, dirty, scummy pond, I felt clean as I walked out of that water that, that day. The truth is life is a mixture of up and down, good and bad, wins and losses, and all of that. But it's important for us to remember our baptism. And to remember that we are baptized. Oh, that God would tear open the heavens today that we could actually see Him. And see the Holy Spirit ascending. Number three, baptism unifies us. It's another purpose of it. It unifies us. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. The church is one body made up of all kinds of different nationalities and tribes and peoples and colors and all of these things. But it's one. And baptism is a way of placing us into that one body. It initiates us into that body. Water baptism is a picture of that as well. When we take communion, when we receive communion and the bread and the juice, that one loaf represents the entire body of Christ is broken for us. And when we do the baptism, the water baptism represents us being one body as well, part of that body. So it brings us together. It's something that unifies us. And we can agree and we can say, you know, remember your baptism. Yes, I remember my baptism. Not because maybe I can recall the exact day or an event, but that I know I was baptized. It happened. And number four, the other thing about baptism is it affirms God's love for us. 
to know that we've been baptized. It says here, when Jesus was baptized, He heard the voice of God say, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What a wonderful expression from the Father. But you know, I feel, I feel like I heard that as well. I don't think that was just reserved for Jesus when He said that. I believe God smiles on all His children. And I believe it brings joy to the heart of God. And someday we'll stand before Him and He will say, you've been, you've been faithful over a few things. Good job. I'm going to make you ruler over many. Baptism affirms God love, God's love for us. To know that I'm baptized gives me that assurance to know that God loves me. Martin Luther, I've told you before that he said there's no earth, uh, nothing on earth greater or more comfort than baptism. And he proved this in his personal life and in his experience. He admitted that when he was in distress or affliction, when anxiety would overtake him, he would comfort himself by saying, I am baptized. I am baptized. It's a constant reminder of God's love for us. By that he was saying, I belong to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is how we know that we are one of His, because we identify with Christ. The song says, Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. We're part of the family of God. As we think about that today, what it represents, what this water represents here today, is something very significant, something very powerful, something very unique that happens in the life of every child of God. And as we move into this, I'm going to ask you musicians to come. We're going to sing. We're going to sing uh, some Page 453, uh, it's also on the screen. More love to thee. Invitation is open today, by the way. If you've not been baptized, uh, you could still come up as a way of remembering what you're going to uh, think about what you're going to do. Uh, this is not baptism. This is a remembrance of your baptism. But we'd love to, if you have never been baptized, we'd love to share uh, that with you and be a part of that. Please stand as we uh, sing number 453, all verses of More Love to Thee. Thank you. 
have a hymnal, turn to page 50. Uh, feel free to join me. Does anyone need a hymnal? Everyone got one? <coughs> the introduction there on page 50 says, Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated in God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. And this is God's gift offered us without a price through the reformation, uh, the reaffirmation of our faith. We renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. On behalf of of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord, in union with the church with Christ as open to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? I will. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the Scripture of the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He ascended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your Spirit. He called His disciples to share in the baptism of His death and resurrection to make disciples of all nations. Declare His works to the nations, His glory among all people. Lord, pour out Your Spirit, and by the gift of water called to remembrance, the grace declared to us in our baptism. For You have washed away our sins. And you close us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ we may share in his final victory. All, All praise to you, Eternal, Eternal Father, through, through your Son, Son Jesus Christ, who was with, with you, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit lives and, and reigns forever. forever. Amen. Amen. And so today, we want to invite you to come either one at a time or as a family, and give some space for other people to come. And this is a time for us to remember our baptism and to be thankful. And as you come, uh, we, we invite you to pick up one of the uh, clear rocks here and let it be a symbol of your baptism. There is water for those that may want to, to dip. Uh, don't 
I understand we got a pandemic, so don't feel like you have to do that. But whether you do or not, uh, as you pick up a rock, feel free to take that with you. Take a moment to just be thankful, to remember your baptism, and to be thankful as you come. Please join me under a thanksgiving. Let us rejoice in the faithfulness of our covenant God. We give thanks for all that God has already given us as members of the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We will faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. As the acolyte comes to take the light to our community, hear the benediction before we sing. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. We go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. Let's sing number 664, Sit Forth by God's Blessing. the people of God from this dwelling take leave the service is ended oh now be extended the fruits of our worship in all who believe the seed of the teaching receptive souls reaching shall for God and for all. God's grace did invite us, and love shall unite us to work for God's kingdom and answer the